This is part one of two of our symposium with Eric Myers. Myers is a counseling astrologer, author, and philosopher who considers himself a work in progress towards greater awakening. His focus is on spiritual growth, emotional healing, and the discovery of life purpose and relationship astrology. Eric finds that astrology clarifies each person's unique path of spiritual awakening, moving from our attachments and egoic concerns into trusting and connecting with all of life. He intimately understands defense mechanisms, unprocessed emotions, unmet needs, and the karmic issues that composes spiritual work as an astrological counselor focuses on centering in the heart and awakening. His style is opening and compassionate, yet also focused and direct. Eric is the author of Between Past and Present, A Spiritual View of the Moon and Sun, Uranus, The Constant of Change, Elements and Evolution, The Spiritual Landscape of Astrology. The Mountain Astrologer has interviewed Eric in Climbing the Spiral Stairway and ran a feature article entitled The Astrology of Spiritual Awakening. His latest book, The Astrology of Awakening, Eclipse of the Ego, was released in 2012. This is the first of a series. The next planned will be Volume 2, Chart Application and Counseling, scheduled for release in 2004. I would like to welcome you, our listeners, and thank you for joining us here at Sky Blue Symposia, a convivial gathering for stimulating conversation and a free exchange of ideas. I am Susan, your host, and joining me on this roundtable are Lenny and Bridge. And kindly joining us on our symposium today, we have Eric Myers. Welcome to Sky Blue Symposia, Eric. Wow, thanks for having me so much, um, Susan. It's really quite an honor to to be with you. Well, we've been looking forward to this, and uh, it's a good time to explore all these things, and I'm hoping that uh, your take on astrology will be very informative to our audience. And our first topic that we have is we'd like you to talk a bit about current astrology at this time and what you see as paradigm shift or awakening period. Sure. I think to understand this time, we have to look back about 40 years into the 60s And we had the conjunction between Uranus and Pluto in the 1960s. And that was roughly between 62 and 70, depending on how generous of an orb you're going to get for the event. But regardless, it was the seed time. The conjunction is a new beginning. And certainly that decade felt like there was a new start. And what it has to do with is, well, you had the planet Uranus which has a lot to do with modernization and revolution and innovation. And the planet Pluto, which is about things that need to emerge kind of from the unconscious. So it's about liberating our desires, the sexual revolution, liberating what we know to be as more fair, civil rights and feminism, liberating new ideas, the humanist movement, that deepens our experience of the world and democracy and so many areas, what we're having now is the next major alignment since then, the square. And so we're picking up on what was begun 40 years ago. And this square has so much to do with actually implementing changes into businesses, 
corporations, things that are more conventional or traditional, that's Capricorn. These are all being reformed and in order to bring in a new day, which is Uranus in the sign of Aries. And so part of this time is confronting and addressing the forces and the challenges of opposition. So it's a very conflict-oriented time. It's not just like the 60s, hey, you know, it's a new day, the age of Aquarius, and let's go to Woodstock. Now it's much more of the real gritty work. How do we implement new consciousness into how we govern our lives on this planet? Well, you mentioned that we're in the 60s. This particular cycle was a conjunction. Now we're in a square. And to me, a square implies that there's friction between the energies. Is that correct? Yeah, it's very frictional. And the the square is kind of urgent change. It's not, quote unquote, easy. But if you're interested in growth, then the square is a wonderful aspect to have because it really puts the rubber to the road and say, okay, here's what we need to look at. And, uh, And if we don't, do the necessary adjustments to be more conscious, then we're going to get the reality check from the universe of what is broken is going to be a lot more clear and evident. And so, yes, friction is a great word. It's just really a time of if we don't do this, then we're going to have some some dire consequences. So it really places the urgency on us. And you mentioned that Uranus has moved into Aries. Could you speak a little bit about what that feels like? Aries is the first sign of the 12 of the Zodiac. And so there's a renewal with Uranus or any planet when it goes into Aries. And so the flavor is if it's a fire sign and it's a cardinal sign. And so it's about new beginnings and about you know, just seizing a new day. And Aries does have a lot to do with the individual. Uranus in Aries is asking all of us basically to use the phrase, be the change we used to see in the world. That is up to each one of us at an individual level to awaken, to participate consciously in culture and society and recycle and use green technology perhaps or whatever else we can do in order at the individual level, because if you don't, then how is change going to be widespread if we all aren't kind of modernizing our routines is what Uranus in in Aries is really about. Then, of course, this is in friction with Pluto and Capricorn, which is the milieu, the business, commerce, traditions, just the way society is organized. There's a lot of petitioning of the dominant factions of society to be more conscious. And so what you see with Occupy Wall Street and what you see with many other types of protests throughout the world is this petitioning for the power structures to open up. So Uranus and Aries almost makes me think of like the flash mob carrying torches and pitchforks of we're not going to take it anymore and we need to modernize and And then you have Pluto and Capricorn walled up in their mansions or in their businesses. That's really some of the flavor. And we've seen a lot of that, but that's kind of a cartoon. It's really much broader than that. But back to your question, I do think that Uranus and Aries is this sense of uh, the fire is like, you know what? Let's create a whole new way of operating on this planet. Why not? And so that motivation and that fiery spirit is, and it's kind of like, you know what? Why not go down swinging? Let's give it our best shot. That's kind of the flavor. I'm wondering if with Pluto in Capricorn, which is about systems and authority, the Capricorn is, Mm -hmm. engaging in this friction with Uranus that, as you said, is more about the individual and what the tension is there is, is there going to be a shift in power bases having to take more personal authority? Absolutely. And I do think that the way that we organize things will be shifting. Uh, if you look at politics as one example, the 
two-party system here in the U.S. A lot of people have issues with that, and I think that might be reforming or adapting in some way. And already we've seen the emergence of what they call the Tea Party. And how does that make sense with the traditional two-party system? And there's a lot of rumblings, perhaps, of a more centrist party because the both of the major parties are becoming very polarized and and kind of entrenched. And so what about what they call the sensible center? And so there's a, you know, in within any field or within any angle that you want to approach this, there is going to be the requirement to review how we organize things to adapt our prevailing systems and paradigms and ways of operating are no longer as relevant in the 21st century. One thing I do want to mention about the Uranus and Pluto, the uh, way that I was speaking earlier might give someone the impression that Pluto and Capricorn is always more conservative and Uranus is always more progressive. That's not necessarily true. The issue of gun control in the U.S. shows this on the on the opposite way, whereas you have a lot of people who Uranus and Aries, I have the right to bear arms and you don't get to take that away from me. And I don't care, you know, I'm not going to break the law. That's my prerogative. And then Pluto and Capricorn does sound like control from the authorities to limit this unchecked, unbridled kind of freedom. And so on this issue, you actually see it reversed where more progressives are advocating for more control, Pluto and Capricorn. And more conservatives want more of that freedom. It's not always so black and white. It's just, in general, how are we going to reform things to modernize them with the consciousness that's emerging now? Wow. Wow. It's just amazing to me how all these energies play out. Um, <clears throat> there's all. Are there any other big um, conjunctions or aspects right now that are influencing us on a collective level. Sure. The other major outer planet is Neptune. And Neptune is recently in in the sign of Pisces. And it will be there for about 12 to 13 more years. And this is the ideal complement because Neptune in Pisces is really primarily about two major things. One, the dissolution, the endings. That's Pisces, the final sign where things dissolve and return back to source. So the ending of what we're ready to say goodbye to and let go of. And and then the visioning process, uh, anything imagination or inspiration or cultivating a vision is part of Pisces. So there's an enhanced emphasis on anything uh, contemplative or meditative or spiritual. So we can kind of download, so to speak, what the vision is So when we are reforming government and business operations and systems, we have a sense of what we want to put into the new frameworks. And so that is this complementing kind of energy. Hi, Eric. This is Bridget. I was wondering how you feel that astrology can be used as a tool for viewing larger social changes rather than individuals. So, for example asking the question, what's the horoscope for the Western world rather than what's my horoscope for today? I don't know if there would be one just for the Western world, but in general, these transits that we've been speaking about are the more collective level. And so, yes, you can look at things as we are through this lens. And then at the individual level, everything we're talking about, the Uranus, Pluto square and Neptune and Pisces does something different for each individual's chart. But you don't need to apply them to an individual's chart. You can just look at the cosmic weather, so to speak, and understand how things are unfolding. Now, it's important to mention that astrology, at least in my understanding, is not a predictive system. It's archetypally predictive, but not literally, meaning that we know the general themes and dynamics that we'll be addressing, but we have no idea how that actually will play out because we're in a co-creative relationship with the universe. We're not just sitting around receiving everything and we have no free will and no role to play. No, we actually partner with these energies. We are these energies. And because of this co-creative relationship with the universe, we really don't know. Contrary to the legacy of fortune telling 
that astrology inherits, I don't think that we could ever really know what's going to happen. And it's so wonderful that we get to create it. And so we know Uranus moving into Aries collectively. We all need to learn how to behave on an individual level more consciously. We all need to take concrete measures in our behavior patterns in order to be the change we wish to see. That's just one example. I mean, there's so much astrology reveals of how we can be kind of in alignment or in accordance with these natural energetic cycles. That is extremely empowering for anyone who wishes to look at it. One thing about it that, that I like to say is that everything in astrology works in cycles. And it's really no different than following the seasons from spring to summer to autumn to winter. It's just looking at the seasons in this broader archetypal kind of format of new life and the different 12 stages and back to endings. To me, astrology in many uses has been divorced from nature and the elements and the seasons. But really at the core, that's what it is. Oh, great. Thank you. Eric, uh, this is Lenny. When you're talking about astrology being in cycles and how things go around their full circle, the outer planets take a longer time to transit, and, of course, the inner planets are faster, so that the cycles of the outer planets impact people for a longer time, and a greater number of people um, would have a certain planet, and they would share the placement of a certain planet in their chart. Mm -hmm. So... How would the cycles of astrology affect the generations so that you have all the people who grew up in the 60s have Uranus influence, the Uranus-Pluto influence in that conjunctive way? And then what about the people who are being born now? Is there anything you can say about the interaction of the generations based on the outer planet movement? Let me give a little bit of, of the structure here. Pluto is in each sign... It varies because it's a regular orbit, but on average, Pluto's in each sign for roughly about 18 or 20 years. That varies depending on, on what signs it's actually in. Neptune is in each sign for 14 years. Uranus is in each sign for seven years. And Saturn's in each sign for about two and a half years or so. We share these attunements with large segments of people that are born around your age and so you can look at the Pluto in Virgo generation or Pluto in Leo generation. And you can look at that wide swath of people. And let's take the Pluto in Leos. I mean, they were born in the 40s and the 50s. Pluto went into Leo, I believe, in 39. And so in the 60s, you had a lot of people coming of age in their 20s who had Pluto in Leo in signature in their chart. And they became all of the famous musicians and celebrities that were young in the 60s. They all had Pluto and Leo. And so there is a lot of breakthrough and transformation around celebrity and fame and entertainment is Leo. And certainly that generation made a big mark. I'm in the Pluto Virgo generation that comes next. And this generation is really focused a lot on well-being and healthcare and self-improvement and service. And it's almost like the Pluto and Virgo generation is cleaning up a bit because there's always a shadow with each generation, especially with Pluto. And so every generation has the next zodiac sign and each sign kind of corrects an imbalance of the prior. So that's what's going on on a collective level. And then, of course, Pluto's only one. You can look at the Neptune generation and Uranus, and it's just cycles within cycles. So it is fascinating to do historical look at different uh, generations. I mean, you had the Pluto and Cancer generation before Pluto and Leo, and here's where you had a lot of more traditional, conventional values. And the way that the Pluto and Cancer people when they were in their prime, they really wanted a stable family unit. We don't need everyone getting divorced or doing all these other optional things. Let's keep the family unit intact. But that might have stifled individuation. So the Pluto and Leo came along and individuated and so forth. 
I like that. I, I was thinking of Ozzie and Harriet and Donna Reed shows back in the Pluto and Cancer times. All the Pluto and Cancer parents, or some of them may be Pluto and Gemini, but a lot of them Pluto and Cancer people had children who really upset the more conventional <laughs> family unit. So <laughs> they had to they had to learn about that and, and learn how to let go. That's great. Well, that was kind of my interest in how the generations react because of the outer planet transits and placement in their charts. And then how about the inner planets? How do the inner planets impact people? It's best to think of the inner planets as more of the trigger planets. So the slower something moves, meaning the outer planets, the more big picture, the more process, the more... For instance, Neptune is in Pisces for 14 years. It's going to be working on that archetype for 14 years. And within that 14 years, you'll have the quicker moving planets fill out more of the scene. So Jupiter and Saturn relate to culture and society and the way we organize business operations and political parties and things that are more just structural and cultural. Then the inner planets are much quicker. And Mars is just kind of the ultimate trigger of energetically what's happening. And so you'll see very soon next month when Mars moves into Aries and it will trigger the Uranus Pluto square, it will be very clear. Trust me on this. I've been watching this for many years is that the, especially this gun control debate, I think it's going to explode. Maybe votes are going to be, or some kind of rallies or what have you. So the Mars is, that fiery energy of just where the energy is being kind of dis- discharged. Venus is another more trigger planet like Mercury. And so Venus, roughly speaking, has a lot to do with social relations and with issues around values and money and Mercury about communications and ideas. And so these things are moving around as well. I guess the analogy would be is think of the outer planets like the slow hand on a more conventional clock and the inner planets as being kind of like the uh, fast hand. Uh, circling around much quicker. And then I know you have a lot to say about the sun and the moon, and, and how do they interact with the inner and the outer planets and the whole configuration? Yeah, great question. Um, I really see the sun and moon and the monthly cycle is just the ebb and flow. We're involved with this um, monthly waxing, climax at the full moon, then then waning. And so that is the centerpiece of this kind of rhythm that we're in. So if you look at a event at the full moon, let's say when there is a full moon, the Mars, the trigger planet is going to trigger things much more visibly and obvious because we're in full illumination. And however, if we're right before a new moon at the quietest and darkest time, there'd be, it's more contemplative. It's just softer and more subtle that you're not going to see things as overt. And so you can look at the sun and moon as just the centerpiece. These are the two center uh, energies of astrology. And so I would encourage you to just look at that monthly dance of where we're building, waxing or, or waning as kind of the context of where you might see some of these other things. And as uh, I'm thinking of our listeners, they might be wondering about uh, – when Mars is going to trigger Uranus and Pluto. I can tell you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it moves in in mid-March. I can give you the exact day. Yeah, look for this around uh, – Mars goes into Aries around March 11th or 12th, March 11th, and it will be on the Uranus-Pluto square very tightly pretty much the rest of March. And so the second half of March is going to be very just fiery, com- combative, climactic types of um, – of things happening, uh, potentially violence, if not violence, and certainly a lot of antagonism and conflict. And so you can check that out in the second half of March. And then it doesn't really end at the end of March. I mean, you have a bunch of things that are in Aries in April as well. This spring in general is going to be very lively. It's all, the other thing about astrology that is often a challenge is sometimes people like to isolate one or two factors and put all their eggs in those basket. I think you see this most clearly when someone says, hi, I'm, I'm a Libra. 
not really. You're much more than that. And so you don't want to isolate and just say, okay, I'm going to look at just the Mars cycle and draw these conclusions. You really need to weigh many variables, but it does look very lively, as, as you were saying. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Eric, this is Bridget again. I, I was wondering how there's, people have been talking about the rise of the feminine and the balancing of feminine and masculine energies. And I was wondering what the current astrology says about this. I know you talk about the patriarchal value system. Could you talk about that a bit, please? I really see Pluto and Capricorn. If we if we break this down and Pluto is exposing the shadow the underworld, the less conscious, unconscious facets of whatever it touches. So Capricorn, like all of the other signs, is not inherently good or bad in my view. It's just a general archetype that has a high or low expression depending on us and how we partner with it. Now, Pluto in the sign of Capricorn is going to bring out the abusive, the shadow sides of Capricorn. So we have to be very wise about what we're looking at here. So Capricorn and its ruling planet Saturn on its most shadowy side is about the concretization of and preservation of power for the privileged, those who are part of the elite. So the word plutocracy is plutocratic control does very clearly correlate with Pluto and Capricorn. And that's what we're really seeing in, in um, played out, especially with Occupy Wall Street and the Republican Party being so extreme with special interests around power and money and these things, and then the antagonism against that and many other ways on the world. So we really see patriarchy because who's been in control and power for centuries and millennia, primarily in the Western world, of course, it's been men. And so... In general, Pluto and Capricorn wouldn't necessarily correlate with anything masculine, in my view. But because power has been controlled by the masculine, you know, in the Western world, then that's what needs to release control uh, to bring in greater equality and fairness and to expose the abuses and expose how it is unfair and how it is self-serving. And a lot of it is based on profit. One of the things about... Capricorn, and this is true with all of the Earth signs, is they all have something to do with money. Pluto in Capricorn, what the heart and root of a lot of these issues are, is people who have been profiting very handsomely by exploitative and abusive business and corporate practices of some variety. And so exposing that, holding people accountable to that, and then reforming the system is what it's about. So we can see it in terms of gender because men have pretty much held power, but it's much broader than that at the same time. And if we lived in a society where women were abusing power, then it would play out in a different way. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Eric, um, we're going to move on to our next topic. And uh, I'd like you to speak about contrasting conventional astrology with the astrology you're proposing and you work with? Well, speaking of gender, that's um, most, <laughs> most conventional astrology is very dualistically oriented. Everything is seen as good or bad or male or female. And this is because the planet Saturn up until a couple hundred years ago has, was the final authority. And within the Saturnian world is separation consciousness. So we're viewing everything in terms of being separate from something else. And therefore, Mercury, which is the planet of dualism, uh, good and bad, male and female, black and white, etc., orbits within Mercury. So it's been the preferred lens. Historically, astrology has been looking at things only in this mercurial black and white way. Mm. And, and so the sun and moon have been uh, seen as male and female. And it made a lot of sense uh, many years ago because uh, we were under the illusion that the sun and moon were both lighted orbs of the same size uh, encircling 
planet Earth. And therefore, in interest of equality, and they're called the luminaries, it was projected upon them that male and female. And there is validity that uh, from separation consciousness, the sun is yang and the moon is more yin. So mm. this, th this makes sense from one viewpoint. But here's the issue that I'm not staying very quiet about is <laughs> that um, is that we don't live with that same understanding of the universe. Since Copernicus, it is now, what, 500 years ago. So we're not talking like, you know, this is a recent discoverer. I mean, we've known this for a while now. That viewpoint of the sun and moon is no longer accurate. The new reality is that, of course, everything revolves around the sun, and the moon has no lights of its own. It only reflects the light of the sun, and the moon is 64 million times smaller than the sun. So my view is that if you want to look at the sun and moon as being equal, you're really going to need to turn back your clock about 500 years and stay with your head in the sand because the sun and moon are not equal by a long shot. The sun is our source energy. Everything revolves around it. And uh, my view is that the sun can be looked at more in terms of awakening from ego awakening to our interconnectedness, awakening into identifying as part of spirit or source energy. And then the moon orbits planet Earth and it's the foundation of unconsciousness. And the moon is only lit up by the sun. It's kind of like we're physical vessels. That's the moon is physical, whereas the sun is energetic. It's metaphysical. And we're physical beings in separation consciousness. Remember the Earth along with the moon, orbits with inside Saturn. So we're inside separation conscious as physical beings, that's the moon, of that are unconscious, that are growing up to awaken, to realize that we're actually part of source energy. We're all one. Namaste. I recognize the light of divinity in you, that we're divine. And so my view is that we can see the sun and moon from a spiritual paradigm and see it as our source energy and then separation is the spiritual view. And then while we are in the state of separation on planet Earth and our immediate apparent reality is yang and yin and male and female and good and bad and all the rest, but that is only one level. That's not the right. only level. That's the Saturnian level. And if we bring in Uranus, then we're getting to the transpersonal level. So my view basically to wrap this up is saying that of course, astrology only developed with Saturn as the final authority, but we know much more now. So we need to now bring in the transpersonal lens to complement, not to replace, but to complement the more familiar separation lens of the everyday world. That sounds perfect. And it is about crossing that boundary from Saturn to the transpersonal. And Often I've heard in esoteric work um, that Saturn is the dweller on the threshold, that you have to go beyond that. Also in your book, you mentioned um, about the moon as more the past yes. or the ego. Could you sure. speak about that a little bit? Absolutely. If you think about everything being creative possibilities and energetic just potential. That's the sun. Mm. And that's, and that's our source. There's, you know, it just gives light and energy and awareness and presence to anything, anything under the sun is possible. And then what the moon does is that it takes all of that massive possibilities and contracts it. And the moon is 64 million times smaller. It focuses into something physical that is me. So all the possibilities, nope, I'm going to have identifications and attachments and this is me and things that are beyond that well that's not me there's obviously a physical boundary i've got my skin and this computer sitting in front of me is not me and so what the moon is about is concretizing things for usefulness in the separation realm and so it's it's very there's nothing wrong with any of this but that contraction then limits the further expansion into what isn't you. So if we have these rigidly defined attachments and identifications and stories, 
then we really shut off from what's beyond that. So my view is that the moon relates to the past and what's been concretized in our soul journey, what we've absorbed. And if we have an issue with something, then my view is that it moves, we, we hold on to it. If we don't have an issue with something, the energy process through us. For instance, when you took a walk down the street a month ago, nothing happened. You don't sit and think about that experience too often because it's really unnecessary. But if something really critical happened on that street, like you got hit by a car or, or you saw a bank robber or something like that, a robbery or whatever, then you'll remember it. So the moon is holding on to its memories from the past because it wants to learn from it and it's maybe unresolved about what was happening. So it's going to retain that. So the moon is just simply what we're holding on to. When we let go, it's kind of like we are what we energetically eat. When you eat something, you need to burn it off or re or release it as waste. And so you can then burn it off. That's literally the same thing. Calories is how we burn things off. That's the sun. Whereas what the food is like the moon. And so that's the analogy that we can see. So we're always processing food through our system and we're always processing energy through us at a spiritual level. And so the moon is simply what you're holding on to that hasn't been processed through. And my view is that we need to learn to resolve what's in the moon. We got to give back that energy, the spirit and the, the underlying core reason of why we're holding on to something to me is love. The moon water has a lot to do with love. And we generally hold on to those experiences where we didn't feel love. And so we remember those things. Sometimes the moon wants to get back at people or holds on to egoic defense mechanisms. And a lot of it just comes down to love. So my view is that in order to awaken the sun isn't about always having peak experiences and meditating. And a lot of it is securing the foundation of self-love. My view is that on a scale one to 10, wherever you are not at 10, you're going to project out and you're going to meet that returning to you in unloving ways until you learn to love yourself and everything you've been through and learn to love all of life. And to me, that really is the prerequisite for awakening. Mm, yeah. It also sounds like letting go of our fears on that level too. Thank you very much. Well, letting go, part of the, the awakened viewpoint is that you're not a victim. You are the actually the co-creator. You're the architect and director of all of your experiences. They were all, you know, necessary for your curriculum and for your growth. And when we accept that and we accept responsibility for co-creating all of our experiences, we can't blame the ego. Uh, the moon likes to blame other people. That wasn't fair. And a lot of it can be very true in separation consciousness. If someone comes in and robs you and they leave, that, of course, wasn't fair and they should be punished. But at the spiritual level is why are you an energetic hook? Why are you bringing that energy in? Why are you energetically collaborating unconsciously with the bank robber or whatever the analogy is? Because they are a version of you that you're interacting with. And so to me, the awakening view is to see, oh, my God. I'm interacting with myself through everything and everyone, and so I can't blame anybody for my experience. Everything was necessary for me to learn a lesson, and I accept those lessons, and then we learn to grow up. So the moon is very instructive of where you're still in your regressive self, where you are resisting life, where you are not coming from love, where you have been hurt. And, and then Pluto would be the shadow or the unconsciousness from the foundation of the moon. And Pluto is those things that are even deeper, that are totally unacceptable. Whereas the moon is like, I can accept this. I don't like it, but I can accept it. Pluto says, no, I don't accept this whatsoever. I'm not even going to identify and own it. So we have to do our shadow work as well uh, as part of healing the uh, moon. Is moon more personal, the personal shadow, with, whilst the... Uh... Pluto, more the generational or transpersonal shadow? No, I would say that I wouldn't even call the moon uh, the shadow. Moon is just in darkness of unconsciousness. Think about the sun hitting the moon. Uh, mm -hmm. Anything physical will cast the shadow, and then the shadow ends up in a point really far away because it's a powerful light source. And so Pluto is the shadow 
that would be kind of like the end of what's being cast from the moon. So I wouldn't say that the moon, the moon is dark. And so it's unconscious. And the sun is about awareness and presence and, and our life energy of source. And so that's the way I would see it. And so the Pluto would be the things that are banished away to the outer regions of the solar. I, I, I refuse to accept these things. They're, so that's why they're in your shadow, because you're not identifying with them. And so to me, Pluto is very personal at one level. It's, it's in whatever's in your personal underworld. The monsters under your bed is Pluto. Then it does also have collective and transpersonal correlations as well. And the Mm -hmm. collective shadow can go with Pluto. Things on a collective scale, for instance, everyone turning a blind eye towards genocide and not protesting and just, you know, staying quiet. That's an issue with the collective shadow of why people collectively behave that way or many other examples as well. So there is a collective level with Pluto, but ultimately in your own chart, it's very personal. And I, and I think it's a distancing of responsibility to look at anyone's Pluto and say, Oh, they're just part of the Pluto and Virgo generation. And they're here to then contribute to healthcare and diet and nutrition. Well, I would say, no, they've got a wound around Virgo things And when we do our work, we teach what we're learning and we join with others as part of the generation, as part of those movements. But I think it's a great mistake to see anything in your chart as different as as not you. Everything is you in in your chart. Mm. Mm. Yeah, very true. Eric, you've you've written a number of books. I wonder if you could talk about these. Um, Would you like me to read them out or would you like to share with us? Either way. um, Okay, well, you've got the Astrology of Awakening, Elements and Evolution, Uranus, the constant of change between past and presence. I like that. Presence, not present, but presence. Yeah. Yes. So I actually did write one book before that I don't market or sell. It was me learning how to be an author called The Arrow's Ascent, and it's a highly experimental not that accessible work that I did when I was uh, at my Saturn return when I was, you know, 29, 30. Anyway, the, the books that I sell and, and speak on the between past and presence is, is my most basic book. And it's just, how do you apply this understanding of the sun and moon to basic chart application? So I look at the sun and moon through the various signs and an aspect uh, to different planets and what that might mean. And it's more general and basic I was actually working with a major publisher, and so they wanted a more basic book, and then they ended up dropping me, so I self-published it, is Mm -hmm. what happened, because they thought it would be a little bit too unconventional. They were worried about about profit, and so my own brush with mainstream things stifling innovation. But anyway, it got me to write a more basic book that's accessible, so – I would certainly recommend that as my most basic book. Then Uranus, just because I'm a Uranian and I love doing my own research on um, people and current events. And uh, so I just did a a book on Uranus looking at the uh, revolutionary planet from a variety of different sides within individuals, within society, within culture, within the cycles with the outer planets, looking at it at the transpersonal level as the matrix, so to speak, that we're interconnected in as this large kind of nervous system. So I look at it within personal, social, and transpersonal. Those are the three sections of the book. Then elements and evolution it was a big shift. I What I wanted to do here was more philosophical book. As I mentioned earlier, everything does relate back to the four elements and really understanding the four elements in a more spiritual way because conventionally – Fire is not really seen in terms of uh, source energy or spirit, as as we've been talking about with the sun. And fire is seen a little bit more in personality ways, like enthusiasm or, or things of that nature or assertion. And that's relevant, but I also see that the four elements connect in with body, heart, mind, and soul. And uh, we see this breakdown universally within many cultures and spiritual past things being really organized and understood in terms of the four elements. 
a lot of Jungian psychology goes straight from uh, the four elements and, and there's many, the Myers-Briggs and so many things. And so I wanted to um, flesh it out of what the elements are really about on a spiritual level. So the way that I talk about it is that uh, earth can be looked at as more neutral and more structural. And it's just kind of the foundation of things and at the physical level, then water is the other physical level, which has a lot to do with, like we talked about with the moon, about being in separation, being biological beings, being a part of the great web of life, the living, breathing chain of being is the water level. And so that is charged is my term for water, whereas the physical level is neutral, just the, the more earthy. And then water is the charged element where things actually have emotion and sensitivity and vulnerability. Then air is looked at as neutral as well, but it's the intellectual and conceptual frameworks that organize life, like logic and mathematics and the scales of music and even astrology, things out in the air that organize things. And then fire is looked at as the energy of vitality, of source, of spirit that permeates all of life and it's also charged. So I bring in this neutral charged idea to the four elements and then it changes everything because all planets, signs, and houses go back to the four elements. So I'm bringing in this understanding that they can be looked at in terms of being neutral or charged in addition to being seen as yin or yang. So there's a lot of reforms that could occur should people want to bring in this uh, dichotomy, which is pretty universal. It's left and right brain. But we didn't understand hemispheric functioning when astrology began a couple thousand years ago. So it wasn't part of it. And so my view is, are we going to continue to ignore it or can we reform the system? So that's a lot of what my books are about is what I believe to be as pretty sensible, easily integrated adaptations that, in my view, are way past their time to be included. I mean, things that like the Copernican view, you know, we've known this for 500 years. Why, why isn't astrology adapting to the newer realities? And so I've also run into a lot of great resistance to many of these things, of course, but that's what the Uranus Pluto square is about. And, and so anyway, that's a long winded, you know, explanation no, on, the, on the elements book. And then just simply the awakening book was the more philosophical paradigm shifting overview of how we approach astrology, seeing the patriarchal value system as embedded everywhere throughout the system. And what are we going to do about it and offering some ideas so there's no charts in really, I mean, I put a couple in for various things in the extras. It's not about chart application. It's about paradigm shifts and more philosophical issues is the awakening book. Eric, when you were talking about the elements, I was thinking of the energetic bodies. And I was, when you described earth as the physical body and then the emotional body with water and the mental body with air and fire being the spiritual body just does that fit into your paradigm yeah perfectly but historically we haven't been aware of our energy or light body and within separation consciousness we haven't been aware that our energy actually connects with everything else just like the sun connects everything together in an enormous field of interconnected energy that's, to me, what the sun is about. Your energy is uh, radiates out and connects in with everything. And so conventionally, seeing the sun as ego, to me, couldn't be more opposite because the ego is about separation and me and, and seeing yourself different than other things and your own kind of egoic organization. And conventionally, the sun is seen as ego, but the sun doesn't have a boundary between it's just all energy interconnects your light body connects you to the energy around you. And so to me, it's really perplexing that so many people are holding on to the idea of sun is ego when they're actually completely opposite. Whereas the moon, in my view, is that contraction into our defense mechanisms and our needs for survival and to looking out for me 
to me, the, the moon and the ego seem so clearly correlated. But the sun is our energy body. It is our light body that extends outward. Absolutely. Wonderful. Thank you. We are providing our guest this opportunity for the listeners to find out more about him. Eric, would you like to uh, tell us about your website and your work and anything that you have going on right now? And you've mentioned your books, but you could mention them again as well. Thank you. The website is Soul Vision Consulting, uh, S-O-U-L, obviously, visionconsulting.com. I teach. I'm teaching a class, and I also have uh, private tutoring students that I work with. The main service that I offer is astrology consultations. I don't call them readings because, to me, that is the old paradigm of you go and someone can read your chart like they are approaching it from this really privileged perspective. Now, to me, it's uh, it's a consultation. It's more of a dialogue rather than a presentation. And I love working with people. It's probably my favorite thing uh, in life, I would say, is to uh, be an astrological counselor. I have my master's in counseling, and I've been a counselor for over 20 years. And I've worked with hundreds of people, and I love it. I mean, to me, it is so meaningful and intimate to have an open, non-judgmental, supportive conversation around the truly big picture issues. What am I doing here? What is my soul intentions? What is the karma that I'm resolving? What is my path to greater awakening? What am I contributing to the planet? What is my attunement to relationships or family or what have you? And uh, astrology from this approach, I have found to be so intimate and and meaningful that um, I really love it. To me, and maybe someday I'll, I'll just do it for free. I, I love uh, <laughs> doing consulting so much. It is so special to to join with people uh, at this uh, sacred level. And so mm. all the information about my um, consultations is on the website, information about my books, and then some articles. And then there is a store page and, and just a, con- you know, a calendar page that lists a few things that I'm up to. And I do have to update. I'm looking at it now. I, I don't spend a lot of time updating my website as I should. I do have a few events coming up. Um, I will be in uh, Raleigh in March speaking at uh, their astrology group there. I'm going to be in Cleveland in April and Chicago and Cincinnati doing different events. And then I'll be speaking in Asheville in May. And then over the summer, I also have a few events. I'm going out to California in June and then to uh, upstate New York in July and also Long Island. If people are in those areas and they would like to meet in person, then I do that when I'm on the road, time permitting. But I do most of my work on phone and this work does translate very well to phone. I record conversations with a little uh, gizmo that plugs into the phone line and then I email the recording after the session. So it is quite accessible. And then there's also Skype, which I do uh, work on as well. That's a bit about my website. That's great. That's wonderful. This completes part one of two of our symposium with Eric Myers. 